Yeah, to me, Amanda, that is probably the most exciting part of this field, which is um, effectively taking from the playbook of the chronic disease we understand most. You know, I talk about this with patients, which is like there's basically these three main chronic diseases, which is Alzheimer's disease, cancer, even though of course that's not one disease, and the atherosclerotic diseases, both cerebrovascular and cardiovascular. And those three legs stand on a platform, which is metabolic disease, which is then the, yeah. uh, the, the basically the distribution from hyperinsulinemia to insulin resistance, NAFLD, and type 2 diabetes. So that becomes the table, and you have these legs that stand on it. Of these, I think we have the best understanding of atherosclerosis, where lesion by lesion, we can stage them. You know, we understand what a fatty streak is. We understand what a foam cell is. We understand what leads to calcification. You know, how we go from soft plaque to vulnerable plaque to a ruptured plaque to an MI. And right. we clearly understand, as your point is made, um, to sit there and wait until someone has a major adverse cardiac event to say, oh, this, this guy's got heart disease is nonsensical. Um, I would go one step further and say, un, you know, waiting until a person's 10 year risk exceeds 5% to intervene is equally nonsensical, yet that is still largely the standard. Um, because we know from autopsy studies of teenagers that the process begins then. I mean, it probably begins even younger, but yep. we don't have too many autopsies of people below the teen years, but certainly autopsies of people in their late teens and early 20s who have died for other reasons um, already show foam cells, fatty streaks in some cases. So if I'm understanding you correctly, by definition now, based on everything we understand, anyone who clinically classifies as having dementia with amyloid has Alzheimer's disease, is tau necessarily preceded by amyloid or are there scenarios in which tau arrives with minimal to no amyloid beta? Um, so the answer to that question is yes, but I want to kind of go back for a second. So anyone that has dementia and has amyloid does have Alzheimer's, but they may also have other pathology too. Right, so you could have a mixed dementia where you have Alzheimer's and um, vascular disease, or you could have a mixed Lewy body and Alzheimer's. And, and we know from um, the autopsy studies, uh, certainly that are done um, by Dennis Dixon up in Mayo and Jacksonville, you know, most pathology is actually mixed. I, I don't have the numbers and I don't, remember them, quite frankly, offhand, but I know that the number of pure Alzheimer's is actually lower than the number of mixed cases. So most people have something else too. And is vascular the most common um, additional diagnosis? Yes. And so what does that mean? Let's, let's think about that for a second. You may recall, I, I interviewed uh, Francesco Gonzalez Lima probably two or three years ago. Um, he's here actually in, in UT Austin, um, works with Jack De La Torre and, and they, you know, really have a strong point of view that says, look, it's this microvascular disease that is really a big driver here. Um, and there's a very compelling rationale for that. You mentioned it earlier. It's very hard to make it into your seventh, eighth, ninth decade without unbelievable amounts of microvascular damage. And to your point, if a critical mass of that is reached, it's quite likely that that's going to result in the cognitive impairment and ultimately even higher levels of impairment beyond memory, such as executive function. Um, and if, as you said, amyloid is sort of accumulating along the way, it makes sense that you could have this mixed picture where you have the, the clinical side, so you, you, know, you meet the criteria for dementia, you have amyloid beta, and you have a heavy enough burden of vascular disease I guess it begs the question, if you had a time machine and you could go back in time for that particular patient and you correct the vascular insult. So let's just say in one patient, they were, you know, aggressively, you know, you aggressively manage their hypertension in another patient, you, you know, kick the smoking cessation in 20 years sooner in another patient, you manage the dyslipidemia. 
you're going to impact the vascular stuff. Do you think that has an impact on the amyloid side of the equation? And more importantly, does it impact clinically their development of dementia? I, I think definitely yes. I mean, I know, you know, again, when you had your conversation with Richard Isaacson, you know, he stressed the importance of those cardiovascular risk factors in the development of Alzheimer's. The other thing that we know is, and again, it's not exactly the same protein, but it's so closely related, you know, amyloid is a component of blood vessel walls, right? So, you know, to what extent, you know, I, I think there, there's still room for more understanding in that and what the exact relationship is between normal amyloid and pathologic amyloid. So in, it's important to say in Alzheimer's, the buildup of amyloid is this abnormal length amyloid that's not the usual thing that we find in our bodies, right? So it's changed a little bit. Um, but there is normally amyloid that's part of our being. And so because it is part and parcel of blood vessel walls, it's only natural to assume there must be this interplay between the vasculature and the Alzheimer's side of things. Um, I would be lying if I said I knew what that was. You know, I think that still needs to be elucidated. Um, you know, that's why we have floors of people smarter than me upstairs doing experiments. <laughs> Does amyloid beta exist outside of the uh, blood-brain barrier? Does it, does it exist on the other side of the blood-brain barrier? Honestly, I don't know. Uh, that's interesting. I never actually thought of what, you know, until you said what you said uh, about the relationship to the endothelium, I never thought about that. I, I'm guessing somebody has looked into that. And the answer is probably not enough to matter or else we would simply be doing a blood test to look for enough amyloid, right? Right. Well, that's coming though. Yeah. So, you know, there are some really exciting, I, I don't want to forget about your tau question. Yeah, so yep. we'll I have like, that, that over here. Um, you know, there are some really exciting developments in terms of looking at blood biomarkers, including plasma amyloid, um, in terms of, of potentially having a blood-based test for Alzheimer's. Um, so there has been progress there and I think that, you know, as time goes on, we're going to be able to do these less invasive tests and really have a better sense of both risk for people who aren't maybe symptomatic yet, as well as diagnosis. One blood going based test. The, oh, okay. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Let's go back to Tao and then I want to ask another blood based question. <laughs> Okay, so you, you had asked about whether you could have other things like tau without amyloid, and the answer is definitely yes. You know, um, so frontotemporal dementias, some of them are characterized by abnormal tau buildup in the absence of amyloid. Um, there are some familial genetic um, frontotemporal brain diseases that are characterized by tau burden. Um, chronic traumatic encephalopathy that we see in, in football and other um, boxing and things also have abnormal tau often in the am absence of amyloid. So yes, that definitely has a role in the development of dementia in, in other types of dementia too. We sort of glossed over it, but maybe it is worth explaining what it is that amyloid uh, beta is doing to neurons and what it is that tau uh, is doing to neurons to actually injure them. Do you want to spend just a second kind of outlining those things? Um, to the extent that my blonde self can, I will. <laughs> <laughs> to a first order um, approximation. So, no, but I mean, I, I focus on the, the patient part of things. And I let the scientists do their, you know, the neuroscientists do their part. Um, but, you know, it is this sort of cascade of damage. Um, there is activation of glial cells, which sort of help protect our brain against, you know, um, intruders. And they can release toxins. They can sort of eat, you know, it's called autophagy, you know, eating up our own tissue. 
Um, and so there's damage both inside the neurons and then outside, um, you know, plaques and tangles, and it creates a cascade that eventually leads to cell death. And so is it more the death of the neuron itself or would the, would the injury to the glial cells alone be sufficient to, uh, lead to these symptoms? Cause the glial cells, of course, you know, when I was in medical school, which was not that long after you, I don't, I don't remember that we talked that much about glial cells in, in our neuroscience classes. I feel like we talked more about the neurons, but I know that in more recent discussions I've had with neuroscientists, they really place almost an equal emphasis on the glial cells. Um, so I'm, I'm curious as to whether or not injuring the glial cells in, in, the, in this particular pathology is equally responsible, or at least to a first order approximation, equally responsible for the damage. I think they're more responsible for the damage. Mm. You know, I think that they're part of the cascade that leads to the death of the neurons because they're trying to protect you know, the neurons and in doing so injure them. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Finally, I take conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures and the companies I invest in or advise, please visit Peter Atia, MD dot com forward slash about where I keep an up-to-date and active list of such companies.